Um, thanks for making it. Apologies for me. Uh, a bit of running up the street uh, for whatever reason. Um, this should be a really good debate. It is for me as well, actually. I'm a designer, uh, consultant, but been personally interested in the ethics of design and architecture for quite some time. So um, it's going to be five minutes each for our speakers. I'll introduce them in a minute. Um, and then I'm going to throw it straight out to you guys to ask questions. And I expect some tough ethical questions. Let's encourage free speech and encourage difficult questions to answer. As a very quick introduction for me, I won't take up much, too much time, but the Architects Registration Board very recently said they would revoke all licenses for architects if they do not go on a mandatory course for climate emergency. Okay? Now, there are many ethical questions um, about the climate, but I guess for me, is it now beyond debate? Um, should we even be discussing it in this room today? Um, or are these ideas, such as the climate, as an ethical question, really set in stone? If so, how do we get here? How did that happen? And I think for me personally, it comes also down to me, if you as architects, as experts, can decide what is good for me, what is right for me. Do you have that right, or should we have a debate? And I think, you know, back to the blurb that Austin uh, provided, it kind of, in a sense, comes back to what I think a few of the Greeks left us with, um, possibly to think about. So in one sense, Socrates, he kind of formulated a sort of a Socratic method. Now, I know, Ben, you're a philosopher, so you might be able to improve my understanding. But, but basically, the Socratic method is, in my understanding, is that everything is up for grabs. Every idea, truth, is to be debated, contested, and challenged, because only by doing that can you work a way forward, innovate, or even progress, rather than the alternate, which is about closing down debate, discussion. And then also, on the other hand, another Greek you might have known or be aware of is Plato, as he argued in his Republic, in his famous cave allegory, is that perhaps what we also need is a kind of moral guardian. Um, because to decide what is right and wrong, because as he sort of said in his allegory, the public in themselves do not have the privilege and insight to be fully informed. You know, so as an architect, are you for free discussion, free debate, as a way to challenge ideas, or do you see yourself as playing that kind of guardian type role for us, myself, the public, to help me choose what's right and wrong. So to me, that's what I would get out of this debate, and I'm very keen to hear what the panel have to say. And it's really why we're here, in my opinion. Are we about opening up debate, or is it really already a done deal? So with that in mind, brilliant panel. Um, so we've got Fern Asman, Director Asman Architects. Go to the critical subjects for a, a long biog because I know these are distinguished speakers, panellists. Paul Crosby, far right, head of Part 3 Architectural Association, and then media right is Piers Ben, a philosopher, author of Ethics, Fundamentals of Philosophy, and I'm Martin Perk. So look, over to you, and let's go in the order I introduced you for a five-minute introduction, and then I'm going to throw it over to yourselves. We're going to come back to the panel for rounds of questions, debates, uh, and then throw it back for more questions. We've got until 2.30. My apologies for starting late, but let's make it a packed discussion. Okay, so over to you. Well, Fernand, do you want to start first? I thought Paul was there. Paul okay, first. Paul, that's fine. Go for it. Uh, my name's Paul Crosby. I head up a professional practice at the AA, so-called Part 3, although we'll have to think of another number for it quite soon, I suspect. Um, I'm, I feel, uh, given that Martin's used the word expert in his introduction. <laughs> I'm feeling somewhat of an imposter. I have true imposter syndrome here at the moment. And I find it also giving a talk, and this is serious, um, I find it difficult giving a talk, uh, certainly not a lecture, uh, with the word ethics in the title. 
I, I just cannot do that. Um, with sustainability and ethics in the title makes it doubly worse. Um, we can talk about it. I absolutely agree with, 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 with Martin. I think that's what we should do. There are people in this room who no doubt have more knowledge, more understanding, more experience than I do. And that, in a way, is the point. That's the one point I would like to make in my short five-minute introduction. Because in my career, which is, um, I mean, I'm not going to name names, I, I do quite like reflected glory of the people I've worked for. I've worked from some so-called star architects, although we all try not to use that term anymore, um, but I learnt an immense amount from them. Did we talk about sustainability in those projects? Not, um, not a chance. We didn't even think about it. Uh, we, I've built buildings, hands up. The, where the carbon has just been poured into them. And some of those architects now, well, one in particular, no names, it's on my biography, is uh, now pontificating as a sustainability expert. And you think, where did that come from? So again, one of the themes I would like to explore, since I'm from an academic background, I lead a course where, coming back again to what Martin was quite rightly saying, let's talk about the ARB as well. Why is it that the ARB feels it is upon themselves to become the leaders of educating, of reform of education? This for me is absolutely fundamental. Why is it that crises generate reform in our profession? Why don't we know enough? Why aren't we political enough? Why aren't we at the forefront of change? So, I'm looking, frankly, at a lot of young people in the room. I'm going to put it back to you. Do you know enough to become leaders of the profession? It's a slightly rhetorical question, because I don't think you do. In my experience, unfortunately, it's a realism, it's a truism. I, uh, through my time, my short time at the AA of five years or so, I've, um, a thousand people have passed through my course now, part three. Um, I also examine elsewhere. I read so many essays where people say, frankly, part two wasn't much use. The, the postgraduate qualification wasn't much use. So why isn't sustainability and ethics right front and center in our, in our teaching, hands up, teaching and your education so that we can gain knowledge to become advocates? And I think architecture as a profession is losing its advocacy. How can we sit around a table with a consultant group of all experts, to use the word, all know their stuff to depth of knowledge, depth of experience, um, with clients, how can we become advocates for the environment? How can we be part of a creative design process? Because that's what we are. We are architects because we're creative. But we need to know more and have a position to be part of this discussion. How am I doing for time? Yeah, you need two minutes. Two minutes. Two minutes, wow. So today, for example, just a quick flick of the news, yesterday as well, Labour Party, elections on the way. When is it? November, shall we say? They're getting, they're taking fright. Uh, all of a sudden pulling £26 billion pounds worth of the, um, the so-called annual green investment pledge. Do we have a view of that as a, as, as a member of society? Do we have a view of that as a member of a profession which is right in the centre of, of burning carbon? What's our view on that? What's our view today of the Labour Party One minute. Um, who plans to cut insulation to 19 million, I think it's 19 million homes in the UK? Ro rows of terrace houses that just need addressing. I mean, this is affecting our lives, it's affecting our profession. So the one word I want to leave ourselves on is not just knowledge and understanding, it's competency. And again, I think I, I thank Martin for his introduction, it's fantastic for me. Um, competency is the word that you should all be over. We as a profession should be all over. Let's not be reactive to things like Grenfell. I think it's, it's unarguable that we are in an environmental crisis. So we as a profession have to take control of what we can take control of. So my question I suppose today is, another question is, what can we do about it? I think it's slightly rhetorical. I think I know what we need to do, but I'd be very interested to have your views on how we as a profession 
and you as individuals become competent. Okay, good. Thank you very much. Round of applause. Okay, next up, Fern. Hi, hi, yes. When Austin asked me whether I would be a part of this discussion today, I actually was not really keen because this subject, although I'm extremely passionate about, I probably come quite on a different angle to Paul, which I didn't realize until you <laughs> said anything. Um, and I wasn't going to say anything about this, Artin, Martin, until you said this about ARB. Because of that, I am seriously considering of deregistering myself. Not because it's about the climate or the environment, it's because any body, a body of a government, can make it compulsory to a profession to learn something. I fundamentally opposed to that. Whether there is a crisis or not, and I'm not here to discuss about anything to do with uh, an environmental or a climate crisis. I'd like to talk about the principles of approaching to a, a, a methodical thinking of what architects do. What architects do is different to designers, Martin, that we get an idea and we make it a pr product of it, it becomes, which in our instance, is building, and it becomes the design process. And in that process, there are many things we have to consider. And we cannot be taught at school what those are one by one, every single item. We can only be taught how to approach it. What is the method of improving your pr approach, changing your approach, changing your view? If a body comes and tells me I have to go and learn something I may disagree or agree, it's not the point. I, um, then I found out that I can actually attend these courses and write whatever the hell I want, then I might consider not deregistering myself. <laughs> I, because if I have to go and agree with everything they say, including some of the courses are sponsored by Extinction Rebellion, I'm just saying hello. <laughs> Honestly, so therefore, I said everything I thought I wouldn't say at my opening introduction. How, how do I, do I have time? Any other yeah, minute? Time. <laughs> oh my God, I told you Paul, give me a penny, I will never stop. And I said, I actually ethically do not agree that progress should be halted in the name of environmentalism, not in the name of environment. And I think it's unethical to shut the debate, which has been considered that it's a done deal. This is, this is what it is. There's no more debate. This is what we have to do. And um, also, I find it odd that uh, talking about, n when we talk about the nature, human beings are excluded from the nature. We are a part of the nature, and everything we hold and make and create is a part of nature. So I find that quite baffling, and I did so before even I became an architect and um, I think I had one more thing to say I mean if bees can make hives and it becomes a part of the nature we make buildings it becomes a part of the nature very far, as far as I'm concerned that's what I think and I hate talking about these even in my own practice because I'm judged and um, and I use I engage less and less with younger people about these subjects I'm deterred because I'm scared, really, of being called a bigot or whatever. Anyway, that's all I have to say. I'll answer mm. questions later. Fantastic. All right. Thank you very much for that. Very good. Some good provocations. Two different ways of doing it. So uh, last up, Piers. Thank you <clears throat> very much. Uh, I'm glad imposter syndrome has been mentioned already because I was brought in as the ethics man. And I'm not sure what the ethics man does or whether there's such a thing as ethical expertise. Maybe there is, but it's long, a long story. But I want to just offer some very, very general reflections. I hope will just serve to provoke discussion about how ethics gets into these kinds of substantive disputes that we're having. Um, now, what do we mean by ethics or morality? Again, you can tell a very long story about that. I'm not sure I could really tell it. But let's start from the fact that, generally speaking, in everyday life, we all accept that we have reasons for action. Some of those reasons are good, some are bad, all are perhaps 
open to question, but we have reasons for action. I got the circle line uh, this morning. Why? To get to Barbican and so on. But reasons for action divide into different sorts. Uh, here are two. Uh, we talk about prudential reasons and we talk about moral reasons. There may be more too, but prudential reasons. I go to the dentist. Why? Because it's in my interest to do so. Assuming it is. Maybe it's not. I'm paying £10,000 for a tooth whitening operation that I have no need of. But anyway, um, you know, it's a prudential reason. Moral reasons? Well, what are moral reasons? This is much trickier. There are different moral traditions, different moral theories. Uh, some people think morals and ethics are the same thing. Some people think they're different. I'm not sh entirely sure what to say about those kind of things. But um, we, maybe we could approach this essay if we just say a little bit about the different moral theories, or as we say in the jargon, normative theories that there are washing around in academic philosophy. So um, here's a normative theory that has uh, distinguished Enlightenment ancestry. It goes back to the Enlightenment philosopher Immanuel Kant in the 18th century. Um, he thought that um, the central moral imperative uh, that we must all obey in our lives is that of respect for persons. What are persons? They are, by definition, autonomous. They are cap what is autonomy? They are capable of legislating to themselves the moral law. Uh, so it's both you're legislating something objective, it's there to be discovered, but it's also, it, it also can't be founded on authority. Its root is in reason. Sounds contradictory, but that's um, what he got from it. That means that given his theory, is, that his theory is limited to respect for persons, uh, there are questions to raise about whether a Kantian theory can have anything to do with the environment or anything to do with even future persons. Uh, the idea is, also I should say, there's a particular kind of perspective involved with this sort of theory. You might call impartiality. Some people think impartiality is the defining feature of a, the moral point of view. Um, something that anybody has reason uh, to adopt as a principle of action. Kant himself said that the moral law is basically acting in a way that you can accept that your principle of action should be adopted by every other rational being. Now, notoriously, Kant says, on this view, there are no duties to animals. Um, animals aren't persons in this particular sense. They, they don't legislate morality to themselves. And you might say that th this goes along with other features of animals. So far as we know, they don't regret what they did yesterday. They don't plan what they're going to do tomorrow. They don't conceive of their own existence. In a certain sense, they can't value their own existence. So that, that might be uh, debatable. Um, I don't think... I mean, Kant notoriously says that we have a, a duties to dogs and cats are basically duties to their owners. They're indirect. There are other views of morality, though, which are much more virtue-focused or even piety-focused. Roger Scruton, for example, um, the much lamented Roger Scruton, who died a few years ago, um, thought he was a Kantian in many ways, but he also thought we had a duty of piety to the environment. There's something wrong, intrinsically wrong and contrary to virtue, about using the environment just for our own ends, for exploiting it, overconsumption, all these kind of things. I'm not sure what to say about that. I haven't much time, so I think I'm just planting the thought in your minds because it also affects the building and architecture as well. I want to re just reply on a kind of Kantian perspective, though. Are there duties towards future generations? This is where we want to, to, to come. If you're a Kantian, you've got this question. It strikes me as clearly there are duties to future generations. Architects must think, what kind of buildings am I leaving for future inhabitants of them or future viewers of them two or three hundred times. That strikes me as a possible duty. How are we living in the environment, especially with the threat of you know, global warming, for future generations? Strikes me as a legitimate question. Sorry I've overrun a bit, but that's all. The, those are the, the questions I want you to think about. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> right, while I ask you now for your questions, I need to get my brain together about what has been posed. So, um, yeah, so over, you, over to yourselves. Who wants to ask questions, raise points? Good question. So let's come back to some of these points, panel. I won't read out all the questions if you can remember them. Um, but, yeah, so, Paul, why don't we start with you? I agree. Architects are talking about sustainability all the time. Um, um, I mean, I give, I give talks about this, about the ethos of business, of culture, of practice. I won't go into too many details, but uh, um, 
competition reports, statements, websites, essays I read and so on are mostly surface level. That, that's, that's my point, unfortunately. I th I, and I'll say, I'll say what I said again. I don't think we have a depth of understanding to properly get around the table. That's my point. We're talking about sustainability, but not to the depth that we need to talk about it. I mean, the, the, the debate that's going on at the moment, well, I suppose it is a debate because I'm going to talk about it, between, and, and this is not a judgment about architecture, I should say, I'm not making any judgment about the practices nor the projects, but Marks and Spencer on Oxford Street, let's say, versus the new project that's just been given the go-ahead on the South Bank. And I think there really is a debate to be had about those two projects. Um, coming back to your point about this, I'm never, a, I'm not a fan of stopping development at all. I think we need better buildings all the time. But at what point is the architect getting involved in that to understand the impact? And the word sustainable is used in many different contexts. It's used to mask, I think, in a funny way, a lot of, um, a lot of agendas that should be brought to the fore, they're somehow hidden away. It's a bit like the W programme for women and so on. People say, oh, no, we're supporters of the W programme. We're, we are sustainable architects. And I think we need to be a little bit more honest with ourselves. I think we need to be a little bit more objective as to how... Where's the evidence, shall we say, for calling yourself a sustainable architect? And I, I think, for me, that really is a big issue. Is it a regulatory, let's open up another subject, is it a regulatory environment type issue? Grenfell is now a debate because of the tragic loss of 72 lives on the 14th of June 2017. Well, many more people could arguably are dying because of environmental issues throughout the world, not just in the UK in one building. But what do we do as a, in terms of regulation? I would say, is, is another question for me. Do we leave that for designers to um, have their own emphases, or should it be more, as is on the, on the that's coming down the path right now, uh, to be more regulatory in terms of fire, means of escape, and so on? OK. Can I come back to some of these points? But, uh, but what, how do you respond to also the question that's raised at the back about the sort of moral high ground of us in the West compared to the developing countries? I think it was Ghana. I think it's, out. it's not as Nigeria. I think, Nigeria. I, I think it's hypocritical. And I also quite like playing devil's advocate sometimes. Say that we are, we are progress is harming the world. Say I'm agreeing with it. It's been proven that developed countries with developed economies harm the environment less. So you do not want a country like Nigeria left behind, trying to, you know, um, prison them in not burning whatever they have there in, you know, copious amounts, trying to get them to use their valuable land to install whatever. I don't want to name these because I really don't want this to turn into a technical conversation about what's good for the climate. I really don't want that to. So this is my view. I think it's hypocritical. Hypocritical. Sorry, I can't say it. Um, so <laughs> say it. Say it for me. No, no I, I was making a pun about hypocritical. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. I know. It is. It is. Yeah. And it should. It shouldn't be. They shouldn't be blackmailed the way they are being blackmailed. All the developing countries. That's what I think. In 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 brief. And when it comes to sustainability, um, I have done sustainable buildings. But I refuse to have, we are practicing sustainable architecture in my, on my website, although my recent PR said, Farhan, it's all there, you must, put. I, I am not going to put it because it's ticking a box. Because I know these people, they're putting it there and they're not practicing. I've done one building. A billionaire hired me he, for his refurbishment of a house in Earl's Court. It was a, a new built, it's a newish built, 50s house. We could do anything we wanted. And I said to him, he said to me, well, we were discussing, I said, I got him to hire a research group from Cambridge University to do a report, steel opposed to concrete, timber opposed to, we, we covered the entire roof with PV panels, we used solar panels where we could, da 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 da. You cannot actually produce a proper report 
this versus that as to how the environment is impacted. Mm -hmm. You really cannot. I defy anybody who can. I worked with Cambridge University. There. So that's what I think. Yeah. Okay. Good. Good comeback. Um, Piers, what about the question of ethics and morality? Well, I, I want to distill uh, a, a, a number of things that have been said. I, I'm yeah. maybe not addressing any specific question, but I, the, all these comments have those questions in mind, I think. I mean, there are several questions that have to be separated. There are scientific questions about what's actually happening in the world. Is it the case that human activity is a significant, if not the major cause of climate change? I happen to think it is beyond any reasonable doubt it is. Now, why do I believe that? Um, I'll throw my hands up, basically on the, on the grounds of expertise. People are going to say, oh, well, don't trust experts, or what, which experts, only some experts are hired by the media and so on. I know those arguments. I'm not convinced by them, but um, you know, I, I do think that's the case. The moral question is what you do about it. I mean, I, I suggested towards the end, when I didn't have much time actually, that you know, we, it is very plausible to say we have duties to future generations. Just as we are grateful to our ancestors for creating the institutions, uh, the, the practices, the buildings that they bequeathed us, even though they're not there, they're dead, but I can still be grateful to them. So in the same way, I hope future generations will be grateful to my generation, and especially yours, for bequeathing them a world with, I would say, old-fashionedly, beautiful buildings and safe buildings. Uh, buildings aren't going to collapse, you know, uh, after five minutes in them. Now, when it comes to climate change and all those things, obviously we have to do a balancing act. We have to look at what the science says, recognizing that science is, in, is not infallible, that scientists are people, they have their own biases. Obviously that's true as well. Not often said enough, but it is true. Nevertheless, there's a reason why a medical conference would not invite a homeopath to talk about cures for cancer. You know, the, it, certain things are just established, even if not infallible. Whether that's the case with sustainability and all that stuff, I don't know. I, I want to simply see, it becomes a sort of culture war, and here's how I think we can stop that happening. Obviously, I understand the annoyance people would feel if they're told they've got to spew out a certain view in their essays, or if they got, they've got to use certain buzz terms, or like sustainability, racism, uh, whatever it is. I mean, if you're required ideologically to conform to some agenda, not only is it hostile, it not only does it chill debate, um, it's also, you know, anybody who, who likes thinking of themselves will feel um, got at, annoyed, insulted, or manipulated in being told to bend their essays to an agenda. That, of course, is not to say the agenda's not true. I mean, medical students really are told that, you know, if you want to fix a broken leg, you probably not, not, not go better go to a therapeutic touch specialist who's going to heal it by psychic waves. And if people, it's a, but my, I know somebody went to a therapeutic therapist and touched and, and their leg healed, and you get people saying that, well, you want to say, well, I'm sorry, but you know, it's very unlikely this was the causal mechanism behind it. And it gets very annoying for both sides. It is annoying for experts to have to deal all the time with contrarians. It's annoying for contrarians to be talked down to. We want an atmosphere of free speech, exactly as been said. We want an atmosphere of open inquiry, absolutely. Uh, we don't want to turn it into a culture war. But we also need to believe that there is more or less such a thing as expertise. Moral expertise, I, that's difficult, but scientific, on the whole, yeah. Okay. Brilliant. Uh, come back from the panel. Um, I kind of related, I mean, your question, I'll throw your question out to everyone else in the room. You know, do you think, in terms of how you're being taught in architecture, you know, other discussions apart from sustainability are being sort of crowded out? Uh, uh, around this this whole debate, so you know maybe again you can reflect on that yourselves and sort of say is that true or not. But otherwise, more questions, more challenges. Yep, down the front. So let me bring yourselves back in um, in any order. Do you want to come back, Paul, on some yeah. of these points? Uh, yeah, I, I think there's a very important question over here about education. I really want to come back to that. But in answer to the question that was asked at the back, uh, yes is the short answer. It's greenwashing. I didn't want to use the word, but in, in my mind, it's greenwashing. I'm I'm interested in my investigations and research about business ethos, culture of practice, as to how we portray ourselves. Um, what, what's the evidence, shall we say, as to how architects are portraying themselves both, both through what they do. Well, the evidence of that is unfortunately buildings. We're so obsessed with buildings and objects, it's, uh, for me, it's positively scary. And I think we've just got to get out of that notion of the object. We've got to get more into what the, 
what we do, which is a process, we're a service. We should be talking about our value as a value. I think Piers mentioned the word value. I just want to bring that back into the conversation. What is our value as architects? What's our value as a profession? And where do we get that value from? Well, let's bring it back now to the codes. It's about having integrity and it's being honest and it's being competent and having relationships, to use those words in the codes. Incidentally, as an aside, the ARB standard code, the, the, the architect's code, doesn't mention the word sustainability once. That's a, that's a slight issue. But yes, to, to reinforce the point, I would say it really gets my goat. It irks me enormously when I see we are sustainable architects on the front page of a website and you look at the evidence, which even I know doesn't, um, doesn't back up these vainglorious statements. So I'm prepared to call out those people, and I am doing now um, in, in my own um, efforts. But I, I, I don't want to overlook the question here about... Um, about um, you know, you mentioned the word toxic culture and, and, and academia, yes. <laughs> Things are changing, I, I, I believe. I believe sustainability, and again, coming back to, the, to a man's point here, is coming into education more. My point earlier was, why does it take the ARB to lead, uh, the ARB to lead that? Why aren't the schools, and why aren't you, you as, a, as, as young people in education? I mean, the words radical sometimes come up in conversations. It's not radical. Why aren't students saying, we want more sustainability? So there's change from the bottom up in the schools of architecture, say so that's actually what we want. And I, I think it comes down to maybe specialism and competency as well, and particularly in part two. I think for me, part two education as it currently is, is a little bit too much, in fact it's far too much, of what part one was. Uh, my daughter is, is in science, she did biology, um, in a very particular university, got a very good degree, came up to UCL, did a master's in a very defined subject. She's off on her career now, and I wonder whether architects should be the same. Part two education should be highly specialised. You want to do sustainability, you do it. And it's not a selection, not a question of choosing units or whatever, you choose the specialism you want to be. And I think, I think you mentioned medical and so on. I think. You know, let's, let's sort of think of the profession in a different way as of this GP type education we have and think of it maybe more as a specialism. You want to specialise in certain subjects, that's what you should be looking for for your career. Surely we'd know that after three years of a degree and then do a two year, one year, 18 month, whatever it is, postgrad research degree. Um, how, how do you respond to these points, but also there's a question raised about where the change needs to happen from, the kind of idea of the personal, local. You know, I think before you were probably arguing about it wasn't the case that that's where change happens. It's more that, you know, development is good and, you know. I, I actually, <laughs> I, are we allowed to argue with our panellists? Yes, you are, yes. <laughs> with so I, I was going to say to Piers, if um, you thought that there's, there's these experts you you know you think there's a climate crisis because there's these experts are saying so and um, it is must be very annoying for them to be told otherwise in the 16th century a panel of experts thought the world world was flat and they burned whomever disagreed like the, <laughs> the similar things are happening they they are not giving a BBC you cannot stand up and say a word con contradicting anything to the experts, I believe. And that's one thing I wanted to bring up with you. And with your uh, sustainability, if you think it should be an essential part of the education, why do you think it also could be considered as a specialist subject? Don't you then think it should be? Also, how do you s define sustainable architecture? Or a defined sustainable building to me, one example will do as opposed to another how would you build the most current building just just finished in london in a more sustainable way mm -hmm. everyone answer that as well so um you know throw it out to everybody but yeah. before how we would do you, i'm not saying to you sorry paul i'm just saying in general yes how how mm. is it defined that's why it has become a generic tick off we are sustainable yeah. if you say so before we answer that, 
peers. I mean, you yeah. got a challenge from uh, Alistair, yeah. Alistair about you know yeah. the future generations, a bit of a unknown, a bit of a cop out, yeah. perhaps. Alistair raised a question about whether my point about future generations was a future generation was a cop out. Look, I think we have to look at the logic of all this and, and avoid black and white thinking. Um, obviously, uh, we don't know how the future is going to pan out. I mean, there could be a world war in within five years. I mean, there could be. Uh, the climate crisis might happen a lot l earlier or a lot later than is predicted, or even possibly not at all, though I doubt that. New diseases, new pandemics, new wars, all sorts of things are going to happen. So clearly nobody should be claiming infallibility uh, about how the future is going to pan out. My point in my original talk was purely um, theoretical. Um, do we, in principle, have duties towards future generations? Uh, I suggest that we do. I haven't offered a proof. I think it is analogous to um, plenty of other things that we think, that we probably think we have good reason to think. Our gratitude to the past, to ancestors, for example, uh, for you know, curing um, polio and this sort of thing. Um, and I think, so yes, of course, nobody can claim infallibility about that. But um, there are certain things we can, we can believe with a reasonable degree of assurance about the future, and that if they occurred, would be of a, gro a great magnitude of disaster. Um, when it comes to, I mean, um, future events that are catastrophic, only even small probabilities of future catastrophes must be taken very seriously. Uh, you know, air crashes are very, very rare. Uh, still, it makes sense to wear an air, a, a seat belt perhaps when you're in the airplane, uh, because we take small probabilities, which are very small in the case of air crashes, of major. Very soon. Th this comes to the point um, again about experts. I'm not quite sure what the the thrust of your, your argument was about um, how geocentric uh, theorists of the universe would have been very annoyed by Galileo and Kepler saying that it wasn't the case. Well, obviously, experts get things wrong, uh, but to say that some particular experts got something wrong doesn't mean that we should be suspicious of expertise per se. Uh, to deny that would just deny the progress of science. Okay, I mean, Newton's theory of universal gravitation could be disproved. I mean. Uh, it could be the case that what kept the planetary motions as they were when he did his observations was not universal gravity, but some mysterious ether or spiritual forces. I mean, who knows? There could be a theory. But, I mean, could it be? Should we shut down discussion? No, I don't want to shut down discussion. Let's be very clear about that. Should we host such discussions, give a platform to people who think this? Well, we have to use discretion. But is it the case? Is Newton going to be overturned? No, probably not. Some things, okay. well, some things he have said, yeah. he has said have been over time. Yeah, yeah, sure, yeah, yeah. But it's I think true. Something. <laughs> uh, not gravity, yeah, something. <laughs> yeah. I mean, quantum mechanics is... Mm. Yeah, well... But to yeah. continue yeah. Piers' <laughs> right, point, in my sorry, view, yeah. Mm, yeah. about the future, aren't we also, uh, uh, you know, dealing with the kind of the idea of precaution as well? So the precautionary principle, you know, we don't know what's going to happen, and then that, in effect, can limit exploration, innovation, perhaps. So I wonder what people think about that. And also, just very quickly, who are the experts and where are the experts uh, uh, debating their ideas? Or is it rather that that discussion is more so closed down now? There is no debate. That's how I sort of understand some of the idea of expertise. Anyhow, that's me. So any more questions, points, challenges? Yep. OK, thanks for all the questions. So panel in reverse order, Piers, Verhan, and then uh, Paul. Give you a minute each, unfortunately. OK, tough, right. Tough. Thank you very much. Fascinating questions. I can't really address them all. Uh, I do think that whatever the truth or otherwise of claims made about the need for sustainability and action against global warming, clearly we don't want an atmosphere where an ideology takes over teaching and research. By that I simply mean not that the ideology is based on falsehood, it may or may not be, but we need an atmosphere of free and open inquiry, an atmosphere where you can raise hesitations, concerns you have in a tolerant, a tolerant may, not to say it's respectful, but because bad ideas should not be respected, but you can be tolerant of the people make them and uh, tolerate the idea so they can be discussed. That doesn't mean you give a platform to every crank view around. That's why you know, astrologers will not be uh, on TV after the news predicting the weather, and there's a good reason for that. But nevertheless, we can have a tolerant atmosphere. On the question, again, to return to future generations, Austin made the point that I was equivocated between two 
concepts of obligation to the future, obligation not to harm, obligation to benefit. Well, all I said was there are obligations to the future, and that, of course, includes obligations not to harm. And that's all I really meant. I, I mean, we can debate the other. It's a scope question, and this scope question arises in ethics generally. Kant, for example, thought how the scope of moral obligation did not extend to animals. Why not? Because they weren't rational, and therefore not moral beings. Bentham thought the opposite. Animals are sentient. That is in, that's enough to make them proper objects of moral patience. Um, I tend to agree with Bentham on that issue. Uh, not, not generally, by the way, but on that particular issue. F ge present generations also are old things, as are future ones. Our knowledge about the future is much limited. We don't know how our actions are going to impact the future because so many variables are with gain. But all these things must be weighed, mixed into the balance. That's all. Thank you very much. Give applause in a minute. So, um, <laughs> for hand. Uh, 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 no booze, no booze. Uh, you can I haven't you can got breathe, much breathe. to add to what I would have said, but I, I regret that you feel that this, you're in despair, that it's all bad. It really isn't. Come and see me after the talk. I'll give you a bunch of books to read and you'll cheer up. Honestly, we're not all going to die. We're in, we're in Ice Age. We have ice caps on either side of our planet. That's Ice Age. This no, no, the, this talk to me after yeah. if you want. No, don't, I, f I regret that young people feel despair and this turned into a propaganda uh, and, and very political matter uh, which touches my heart, which um, literally disables me sometimes from talking properly about it. And I agree with you that what the, a lot of the sustainable energy providing objects are not sustainable at all. I do know about that for sure, and I can explain. Paul. Fantastic. So, Paul, to uh, wrap up. I would like to connect a, a couple of points that were made here, and I, I think it's, um, it's, it's what sort of profession do you want to be in? What sort of profession do I want to be in? What, what is the future of, of our pr profession? And I don't... Yeah, I do despair sometimes when I go on, when I, when I hear a lot of architectural talks and I look at websites and monographs and it's about the book. It's about the image and I think we have to get rid of that Instagram sort of idea of architecture. I, I really do fundamentally believe that. We have to think of ourselves as a service, as a profession, uh, engaging in relationships and so on. We have to ban awards. Tomorrow I would ban all architecture awards. If I could do that for five years, put a moratorium on, on awards, just stop them. Including um, giving them back? No, 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 I, uh, yeah, absolutely, give them back. <laughs> and there's a good point, um, and I, I was, I was try I'm trying not to say this, but I'm going to say it. Since we're in, in Austin's company, I hope he forgives me for saying it, that a, that a well-known building won a very well-known award for, um, for, uh, for, for the Sterling Prize recently at Kingston University. And in the citation, it's just two years ago, three years ago, Austin, I can't remember, sustainability wasn't mentioned once in the, in, in the citation. And it's built of concrete. Now, OK, concrete could be argued against. Let's not get into that debate. But, but where was sustainability in the judging criteria of a very, of a, of a very new building? So I, I coming back to your point here, the, the gentleman here, I, I think... I, I would sort of bounce it back. What sort of profession do we want to be? And I, I think we have to be a listening, a caring profession. And ultimately, who is our client? I think, you know, we, we obsess on part three, Austin will tell you this, who's our client and so on. But our client isn't just the person paying the bills at the end of the day. And we have to have a wider remit. We have to go beyond the codes of conduct in terms of advocacy. Thank you very much, panel.